right, what an incredible day so far. Actually, can we give it up for Michael and the incredible staff here? This has been an amazing first day. I've never seen a conference with actual mugs and afternoon tea. This is my, my absolute dream come true. Um, I'm Dave. I'm a first time speaker here at Laracon, so I figured I'd introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dave Hicking. I live in the great state of Connecticut, way up there, roughly halfway between New York and Boston in the US with my amazing wife, Marissa, who's here watching today in the audience with me, filming me like a proud stage mom, it's amazing. <laughs> And yes, this is what Connecticut actually looks like in the fall. If you're not familiar with Connecticut, there's really only two things you need to know. First of all, Connecticut is home to the greatest pizza in the world. Look at this pizza. That's, that's clam on a pizza. It's incredible. And we're home to the greatest college basketball teams in the world. I told Michael when I, uh, when I wanted to speak here that I was missing opening night for my favorite basketball team to be here. Connecticut is also home to my rescue dog, Maybe seen here in her favorite spot on the couch and wearing her favorite Yukon bandana. I wish I was this stylish, but what can you do? All right, a little bit more about me. Uh, I started in IT. Uh, I'm not a developer. I just pretend to be one and work with them. I made my way to doing PM and ops for Titan, took a little side adventure to Yale, but other than that, I've been in the Laravel community for about a decade now. My jobs are always a combination of all kinds of things, but what I really love is helping people and teams of people be freaking great. But maybe above all else, I also love solving problems. So right now, I'm the product manager at Userscape, where we make two fantastic products that, solves, that solve problems for people, which is great. We make HelpSpot, which is for customer support teams, anybody with shared email and you hate dealing with it, like you've got three people trying to handle some box and you don't know what to do with it, we make HelpSpot, it's awesome. And we make Laravel Jobs, the official Laravel job board. You all should use it, hopefully. If you are hiring or interested in hiring Laravel developers, come talk to me. And that concludes the shameless shilling of this talk. <laughs> okay, what is this? Why am I showing you a house? So I recently bought this house. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't get excited yet. <laughs> and let me tell you, it is no fun to buy a house in the U.S. these days. I don't know what's, what's going on here. I'm imagining it's also maybe not that much fun. It's also not fun to prep a house to sell. So in the U.S. at least, you hire a real estate agent, and they give you, they look at your house, and they give you this unbelievably long list of fixes, stuff that you think nobody cares about or stuff you learn to live with, paint touch-ups, cleaning, a piece of trim, who knows what it is, stuff you learned to live with a long time ago, and it's so easy to get so overwhelmed by the long list that you just kind of put your head down and say, all right, I guess this is what I'm doing for the next two, three, four weeks. You're just fixing things, you're just going down that list and you're checking everything off. You're just taking these orders in and you're spitting out results. And if you have moments where you say to yourself, are we really doing this? You just go, hey, listen, they're the expert, not me, right? I, I hired this person, they know what they're doing. I just, I'm just doing what I'm told. But you're not a noob, right? You've bought a house before, you've been in the market, you kinda know what people look for because that's what you're looking for. You have some amount of knowledge and expertise, even if you don't think of it as knowledge and expertise. You can bring stuff to the table. And then it hits you, you're, you're sort of wondering, what am I doing? Like, is all this stuff really gonna matter? You start to ask questions like, is this what I should spend my time doing? What's the most important stuff on this long list that I've got? Will anybody notice this? Should I really spend hours, this is a true story, should I spend hours painstakingly removing a vine from a tree, or should I touch up more paint in my house? Uh, unsolicited housing advice, always touch up paint. Paint your ceilings, buyers notice fresh paint immediately. You wanna spend your time on what your customers will actually notice. What happens is you finally start asking good questions. Not because you're ornery or you're stubborn, although I am both of those things, but because you start taking ownership. You claim your agency, and you start bringing your expertise to the table. You can see where this is going. You stop following orders, and you, you start creatively, and the creative is important. You start creatively solving problems. I know, it's great, we're just over five minutes in and I've already gotten to the title of the talk, this is going well. 
Um, by a show of hands, and I can sort of see everyone's hands here, how many people have ever been asked as a programmer to just do something? Just make a button, make a carousel, oh my God, uh, to just fix this problem? Lots of hands, N not surprised. No creativity, no greater context, just do this thing. Happens all the time. This is my old boss at Titan, Dan Sheets. Co-founded Titan with Matt, who you all heard earlier. Great guy. Taught me a lot about the business, and he inspired this talk. This is not Dan Sheets. This is a great image from the uh, early 2000s. Uh, this is a NBA general manager. Uh, he's working the phone so hard, the man needs two phones. At the same time, I aspire to this level of sales. So, Dan co-founded Titan, and he was responsible for, amongst other things, bringing business in the door. I imagine this is what Dan was doing when he was working his hardest. It meant a lot of time talking to potential clients at Titan about why they should hire Titan. So I wasn't surprised one day when I got a DM from Dan, or it was in a, you know, some channel or whatever, and Dan frustratingly said, we're not just order takers. So if you're like me, you might assume he was referring to a client that was trying to hire Titan. And maybe they weren't fully on board with how we wanted to do things, and they wanted to hire, for lack of a better term, butts and seats. Resources. God, that just gives me the creeps. It, you know, sure, sure, I, we're, you've got expertise and you've got opinions, but we've got, a, we've got all these tickets. We've got all these Jira tasks. We've got stuff. Just let's get some devs on the project, right? Because that's never gone wrong. This could be a whole other talk. I digress. But it turns out, Dan wasn't talking about some client or some person, he was talking about us. He was wondering why we were being order takers. So in an ideal world, Dan, Matt, everybody else at Titan, really all of us, we don't wanna work on predefined solutions, we wanna work on problems, collaboratively, with whoever we're, you know, client, customer, end user, whatever. And the earlier the better. The earlier we can be involved in the conversation, the better off we'd all be, not just Titan, but the client too, and then eventually the end user. Maybe more importantly, we could help them define the problem, scope it down, and help them avoid mistakes that we've seen other people make because we have experience, we have expertise, we've done some of this before, you all have had this happen. Somebody comes to you and they ask you to do something and you're like, yeah, we could do it that way, but I, I know that's not gonna work, or actually, I know some easier way to do it. All right, so why is this better? Well, you all know this, but lots of people who don't know developers, they don't know a fact, which is that you all are not paid by the word or the line of code. You're not paid by the number of PRs, the number of deployments. That would be a weird incentive structure. <laughs> you're paid, you're hired, you're here, hopefully, amongst other things, to solve problems. For customers, you're solving business problems through a variety of tools. Yes, you're writing code. But you're also asking good questions. You're trying to understand their process, what they're looking for, and you've, you have experience of solving other problems for people, right? You're really solving problems by building software all day long, so why let that experience sit on the sidelines? I don't know if this is in the dictionary, but I, I like this definition. Development is an act of creative problem solving. So the more perspectives, the more unique combinations of experiences and expertise that you can bring to bear on a feature, a task, a problem, the better. I think this should be true for all of us. But we had a bunch of hands up earlier about how you were just asked to do something, so it's not always true. Why isn't it always true? Why are devs often disconnected from the larger purpose? Why don't we feel more empowered to speak up? And finally, the reason you all are on the edge of your seat, I know, listening to this talk, what are we gonna do about it? Now, some of you might be ready to yell out, Dave, silly Dave, you're just a PM. We've solved this already. We have Agile. <laughs> Believe it or not, I wrote this before Matt's talk this morning. What about Agile? Let's recap quickly, quickly. The Agile Manifesto, always a classic. If you haven't looked at it in a long time, it's actually interesting. Agile Manifesto says you value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. You value working software over comprehensive documentation. You value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And you value responding to change over following a plan. This is great stuff. This is a banger. 
And all of it remains incredibly valuable. But again, to paraphrase my friend Matt Stauffer, people spend way too much time thinking about if you're agile than actually being agile. That's a word, agile. It's not a, it's not a brand name, it means something. But being agile isn't easy natively for lots of companies, lots of teams. But it became a standard thing that everybody had to do. It was trendy. Consultants, blog posts, conference talks. Gotta be agile. It was the expectation. And so, So you get the agile industrial complex. People started selling processes, solutions, plans, consultants. Apologies to any agile consultants in the room. <laughs> Pretty soon you had to do agile a certain way. If anybody knows what this is, I'm so sorry. This is scaled agile framework, also known as SAFE. The fact that an agile framework is called SAFE is Orwellian. Agile stopped being agile. It just became another way to do things. All right, maybe agile is not gonna solve all of our problems. Awesome. Some of you are like, Dave, I've got this. Agile process, no, I'm just, it's like one or two of us. It's small, we're nimble, we're doing stuff. I'm self-reliant. Got this big muscle emoji showing you how self-reliant I am. I don't need this process, gets in the way. Well, here's the truth. We can't always do it alone. Because, all right, so let's say agile doesn't magically solve all of our problems. Doesn't mean that we know how to solve all of them. Doesn't mean that we were taught. Doesn't mean that we're in a good culture to do so. Doesn't mean that, okay, so maybe we've got good ideas, but we actually have never seen in practice how to put this all together. The word culture, oh, sorry, I see it in my notes. You don't see it here. The word culture is interesting. Let's talk about culture. So let's put Agile aside for a moment. What is it, whether it's a company, a group, heck, an open source community, what is it that actually fosters the kind of collaborative, inclusive problem solving that I think the Agile Manifesto is actually talking about. It's culture. A culture, maybe more specifically, where people feel safe. Safe, you're wondering? What are we doing, what are we talking about? Yeah, safe. Safe to fail. Safe to be yourself. Safe to thrive, to try new things. Psychological safety is what we're talking about. It's the foundation of problem solving. You can't build a culture where people feel free, feel safe to tear that wall down and actually engage and bring their whole selves. Because if they do that, you might fail sometimes. And if you don't have safety, that's never gonna happen. Size doesn't matter. If you're in a huge corporation, it matters. I mean, this applies. If you're working small team, it applies. Heck, if you're working on an open source project with like three people scattered across the world because of the magic of the internet, it still applies. So let's all get on the same page. What the heck am I talking about? Psychological safety is the shared belief held by members of a team, a group, whatever, that it's okay to take risks, to express concerns, to speak up with questions, and to admit mistakes without fear of overwhelming like negative consequences. Okay, that's what it is. Why does it matter? This is, sounds trite, but it's true. If you don't feel safe to fail, you will fail to try. You won't do anything new or unique. We're all this way. You put that guard up, you get that scar tissue, right? And so if you have psychological safety, you're more engaged, you're more motivated because your contributions might matter. You can speak up without fear of retribution, which then leads to better decision making because people are voicing their opinions and concerns. You get a more diverse range of perspectives and you get better problem solving. So this all sounds great. I hope everybody here is like, Dave, this is all good. What are we talking about? And if you're a boss, a manager, a team lead, I hope you're nodding your head. Great. How on earth do I do this? This is awesome, right? How do I build an environment with psychological safety? Boy, I'm telling you, I'm so glad I'm the last talk because we are getting real sexy here with good management practices. <laughs> Stuff like well-established norms, right? People need norms that are uh, documented, that are consistently held so it doesn't feel like one person's playing favorites with another, you know what's fair. You need communication. It says great communication. It should say open communication. And you need to not just practice, 
but teach and model active listening, that could also be a whole talk. I would love to hear a talk on that. This is super important. You, you need to reward the behavior that you want to see. So did somebody on your team speak up and kind of stick their neck out maybe? Celebrate it. Make sure that people know what's expected of them, that this is what you want them to do, and then when it happens, the team needs to actually hear about it publicly. And if you're a leader, or maybe you're just trying to lead from within, if you have any amount of influence in an organization, you have to admit when you're wrong. You have, people are gonna look to you for that, and if you model vulnerability, then they might show vulnerability. Finally, as an organization, you, you gotta replace blame with curiosity. The goal is, that I'm talking about here is you're trying to do great work, you're trying to solve problems, and blame is only gonna stop you and your team from making it happen. So, I just talked about a whole bunch of stuff that managers and leaders, CTOs, et cetera, can do. But I wanna talk about what individuals can do, right? So I said all that stuff and maybe you're like, yeah, Dave, sure, great, I'm not a team lead, I'm just you know, mid-dev, junior dev, just doing what I'm told. But let's talk about what anybody can do. Let's start with curiosity and asking questions. As a developer, heck, as an individual in almost any line of work, unless we're talking about the military, you have agency to ask questions. If you are in a work environment that does not allow you, that you don't feel safe in asking questions, you need to leave as soon as humanly possible. I could put the Lara job slide back up again, but you know. <laughs> so what kinds of questions, right? Questions about code? <laughs> I hope so. Um, God, yes. But what about intent? Like, the, like, okay, what is this thing asking? Why are we doing this? Can you ask questions about that? I hope so. Let's use an example. I hope this isn't too real for everybody in this room. We are not off to a great start. Um, we should get some help writing our tickets, our user stories here. I need a button, that's not awesome. How about this one? I need an export PDF button. Well, that's a little better. So let's say somebody comes to you and says, I need a button to export a PDF. And maybe, if we're lucky, they even tell you what data is in that PDF. <laughs> but you don't get anything else. You're like, Dave, no problem. I've built PDF exports before, easy one. Well, I mean, we were not gonna, we're not gonna tell them it's easy, but you know, we could do this. So let's rewind for a second. Actually, let's pause. Um, let's start with one very important question. We can add some more questions later, but we're gonna start with one. My, one of my favorite questions ever. Everybody who I work with at Titan who's in this audience is getting flashbacks right now. What problem are we trying to solve? So this question, if you're delivering it in an environment where people are encouraged to ask questions, where it's okay to try things, it's okay to speak up, can either clarify that terribly written ticket or it opens up a whole new line of questioning. Like, does it actually have to be a PDF? Did somebody ask for a PDF or did you, they just say, I want, some, I want a report? Does our application even have code to export PDFs right now or do I have to go figure out what package I'm using and now I've got to do this, now I've got a dependency? Hey, could it be a CSV actually? So these might seem like basic questions but I've been in conversations like this so many times in my life. The point isn't that you're being pedantic it's that you're being pragmatic, right? You've got, as a developer, some amount of experience and expertise, even any earlier career developers in the audience, right? You have experience as a user, you have experience as someone with fresh eyes, because what you bring to the table matters. A collaborative approach to problem solving is the best approach to problem solving, right? Because you're not just an order taker, right? All of you in this room are problem solvers. All right, great, we've got about 10 minutes left. We are done with this talk, right? Not quite. Psychological safety and curiosity, that ability to ask questions, that's not all you need. That's a great start. It's not all you need for a problem-solving culture. You need a shared purpose, a shared understanding of what the heck we're doing. So let's say you've got folks who are speaking up, offering ideas, thinking creatively about how to solve problems. You're doing great. But what if you're not all going in the same direction? So go back to that PDF example. What if one person on your team thinks that the priority is, listen, we gotta ship as fast as possible, and our existing customers, they actually just want the data, they don't want a PDF, so let's just give them the CSV, put it out there, call it a day. But then you got sales, somebody else in the corner who's like, no, actually, we're trying to market to this other audience, and they don't know anything about that, and they just want like a graph, just, they want a graph on a thing that they, can, that they can print, and if you give them a CSV, all you've done is give them more work? Great, because what problems are we actually supposed to be solving right now? 
do we all know where we're going over the next sprint, the next three months, the next year? It gets a little fuzzier the further out you go, but like, do we have a shared understanding of what we're doing? If you're all going in different directions, then all that great hard work I've just talked about, psychological safety, curiosity, uh, you just end up being pulled in two different directions and you're not moving forward. Last but not least, individuals need to feel like they have agency. If you're being micromanaged, then you're being treated as an order taker. Call it micromanagement, call it distrust, call it whatever you like. But if you deny somebody at least some amount of agency, then they can't really, they're never really gonna feel like they can actually help you solve problems. Everybody at every company has some amount of agency they can be given, I believe this. Now, agency doesn't mean that people can do whatever they want. It doesn't mean that a junior you just hired, an intern you brought in, can come in and decide, it's Friday afternoon, we're shipping. <laughs> it means that people within this great environment that you have hopefully starting to build for them, they have some amount of control, some amount of say over how their work gets accomplished. Because when you combine these things, this feeling like you have the ability to define a little bit how my work is getting done. I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Uh, you have the ability to define how my, I'm doing my work. You have this shared understanding, this shared purpose. You're encouraged to be curious and you feel that underpinning of safety. Now you're cooking. All right, let's get our hands up again. By a show of hands, how many people feel like they have all of this right now where they work? That's not bad, but we've got some work to do. If you don't have this, I mean, I hope this is obvious, you should. You should advocate for it, you should seek it out. If you have a, any sort of amount of power in your organization, you should foster it, you should try to build it. Not because it's nice to have, but because it's essential. So let's get practical here for a second. I've talked about different responsibilities I think leaders have. I've talked about things that individuals can do, but how on earth do you actually change a culture? So I wanna give you some things that maybe you can take back with you after this talk. So let's start at step one. Don't assume, because you know what they say about people who assume it means that you got a little too excited at your conference. Um, just because you're so pumped after this talk, you're building, you're like, I wanna build this culture, doesn't mean that your coworkers or your collaborators are, they could be busy, I'm sorry, busy, they could be burned out. They've got lives, right? They're doing stuff. They think you're a little too idealistic. You went to Laracon, you got a little too excited. You went to the after dark, you know? Don't assume everybody is just gonna be like, yeah, Dave, I just wanna totally change everything. Don't assume that they're just gonna be on board with your ideas. You, you need to make the effort to understand individuals' problems and challenges and then connect that to what you wanna do, right? So if somebody that you're working with is like, you know, I'm doing this work and I don't really know how it connects to, the, to what our customer's doing. I feel like I'm just throwing stuff out there and nothing happens. See if you can connect that to what you're trying to do. You need to start small and celebrate your wins and I'll be the first to admit, I am terrible at celebrating my own wins. Making change happen in a culture could be a whole separate talk. But if you're trying to change your culture, you're trying to build new culture, you can't just dictate from the top down. You need expectations set from the top down, but then you actually sort of start at the bottom, start small, celebrate wins, build trust bit by bit. You have to prove to people sometimes that this is worth it. Individuals do not like change, right? We hate it. We get comfortable, you get used to stuff. Change is scary. So if somebody asked the challenging questions, uh, they finally you know, stood up, put their arm up in a, in a meeting, or they said something interesting that was out of the norm, you have to publicly reward that. You have to give them kudos. That's a win. You gotta build on that. So I'd love for everybody to pause, take a second, think about one thing you could do today where you work that you could do to improve your culture, to build an environment where people like you are encouraged to be problem solvers. If you're a junior dev, what new habit, what new process could you practice and model for your coworkers to try to encourage them? If you're a team lead, a CTO, what behavior could you reward? What roadblock could you eliminate? Because small changes make a big difference. Not because they snowball or anything like that, because what actually they do is it makes the overall task feel less impossible. I'm gonna crib from Kent C. Dodds, right? 
he was talking about software development, I'm talking about culture development. I think they both apply. You make the change easy, so you can make the easy change. If you can remove blockers, if you can address people's fears, if you can make it seem easier for your coworkers and your teammates to change culture, then they actually might be able to make that change. Because this doesn't happen overnight. So let me give you some advice. Have grace for yourself if you decide to take this on, and your team. Changing culture, building these small victories, changing the vibes, it takes work. Progress is never a straight line, but it's worth it. It's not just worth it, I think it's essential for great products, for great teams, for great developers to be at their best, for all of you to feel connected, to feel like you're being fulfilled by what you're doing. My guy Dan Sheets knew this. Dan, Matt, the rest of the team at Titan, they had done the work of as much as they could to create a great environment for problem solvers to thrive, for people to feel like they could do that. We just sometimes needed to be reminded. And now hopefully we all know this. So get out there. Ask questions. I love to ask questions, as you can tell. Ask questions. Try to seek clarity about what's being asked of you. Challenge assumptions, respectfully, but challenge assumptions. Every small step you take can help shift the culture. It is not impossible. So get started today. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well done, Dave. Thank you, sir. After all this time. Yeah, it took me long on enough. Stage. Uh, did he do okay, everyone? We're happy with that. Uh, we, had a, we had a few questions. You got questions? <laughs> Let's do it. I thought I was done. We got time. We got two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. All right. All right. How could, what could an individual do to try and break a culture that actively dismisses questions or concerns? <sighs> you don't have to answer this. We can have a. Yeah, no, no. I'm get, I got two minutes, right? I can think of it. I'm going to filibuster. <laughs> So, depends on what level of the org you're at, but I'm gonna assume that you really have no power in your, in your org and it's just not allowed at all, right? So, what you can try to do as much as possible, aside from visiting larajobs.com, <laughs> is in any area where you have some influence, maybe that's just working with your coworkers, like people who are on the same level as you, whatever it is, attempt as much as you can to model behavior because a funny thing is that even though like culture is hard to change and expectations can be set, but your leaders, CTOs, team leads, whatever, even if you think they're maybe a pain or they're rotten or whatever it is, or maybe this is just bad, bad company culture, whatever the case is, they will notice if all of a sudden people are acting differently, right? Maybe you can't control everything, but again, trying to model that behavior in any way where you can, it will matter, it will help a little bit. And then, but yes, at the end of the day, you know, if you're trying and you're trying and you're trying and you feel like you're pushing that rock uphill forever, again, larajobs.com or <laughs> talk to people here, um, it, sometimes it is hard, but I would just say any opportunity you have to do the work in a place where you have some control over it, take it. You'd be surprised at what happens when humans watch other humans behave differently. Good answer. Thanks. Uh, last one. Do you find that having one-on-ones is a helpful tool to help add psychological safety? I love one-on-ones. I'm weird. I love one-on-ones. Um, yes. I think... I'm sorry, could you repeat the whole question again? Do you find one-on-ones a helpful tool to help add psychological safety? Yeah. I, so, my ideal world... I could, actually, I talk on one-on-ones. I don't know if people want to hear that. Um, <laughs> Ideally, one-on-ones are sort of a part of a whole like sort of life cycle of feedback that a, a supervisor or a boss is having with an employee, right? So sometimes the point of the one-on-one -on -one is to let the person vent. Sometimes it's to kind of suss out what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's to give direct feedback, right? So I think that, yes, it's a helpful tool for a, a boss or a CTO or whoever to understand how people are feeling if they really can try to make that connection, really try to let their guard down. Um, it's also very helpful to try to set expectations. Not that expectations should only be set privately, but sometimes, 
we all have different communication styles. We're all coming at this from different, different places. So sometimes some quiet correction behind closed doors in a meeting can be really helpful because if you make a mistake or you feel like you've gotten called out, you're just gonna shrivel down, right? You're gonna put that guard back up. So sometimes being able to do that privately is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Amazing. This is more of a statement that's phrased as a question. <laughs> oh, this is good. I, oh, I who, this is the more of a, a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I love this. Is it safe to have 12 meetings a week to discuss all of the work you want to do in between meetings? <laughs> So that's larajobs.com. No, um, <laughs> Amazing. Um, boy, that's really... You don't have to answer that question. No, I'll, I'll say this. Um, uh, meetings get a bad rap, much like uh, project managers and PMs sometimes get a bad rap because um, there's, sorry, fellow PMs, there are lots of examples of bad uh, PMing that's happening out there. There are lots of bad meetings that happen out there. Um, some organizations... You all know this. Uh, all they know how to do is have a meeting. So we have a problem. Well, we need a meeting to solve that, right? So no, that's not great. Um, that's also like another example where any opportunity you have, anything that you control, where you can be like, actually, in my little team or my little corner of this org, we're just not going to have 12 meetings this week, actually. Or we're going to cut this down. Or maybe it's even you, if you, you and I are working together, what used to be an hour-long meeting, we're like, we can do this async. We could do this in Slack or Teams or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Awesome. All right. Let's get him on the stage again somewhere. Thanks, Thanks Dave. <laughs> All right. I'm going to give the room and I'm, we're, we're finished. This is the last talk. Um, we're 10 minutes early, which is amazing. We've never been ahead of schedule for this thing. Um, I'm going to give you the... Do, do I bat another pickleball into the audience or do I get Dave to pick a number between 1 and 10? Pickleball? Oh. A number between one and ten. What do I got? Who, what do we think? Seven. I heard a seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Stephen Simpson? Are you in the room, Stephen Simpson? Oh. Oh, is he coming up? Come out, Stephen. Woo! Yeah, give it up for Stephen. Did, did you all see Joe Dixon fly a flipping drone at Aracon <laughs> US this year using... It was incredible. It was using um, the, 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 the thing, I forget what it's yeah. called. It was incredible. Reverb, reverb, yeah, reverb, reverb, right? right, right. Uh, this is a hat, it's not a drone. <laughs> this, however, is a drone. Oh, hey! Um, just, just today, actually, Joe released a, a course on uh, Laracasts. Um, he doesn't actually fly a drone in the course, <laughs> but check that out as well. Um, thank you very much. Well done. Thank you.